Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. When we begin our work on the superficial cervical region, and particularly in the posterior triangle of the neck, certain boundary landmarks must be recognized. We've already seen and worked in the area of the clavicle extending from the shoulder tip towards the midline at the sternoclavicular joint, and then a line directly up the midline to the point of the chin along the base of the lower jaw and then following downward along the edge of the trapezius muscle. That is the triangle at the side of the neck. Now this triangle is divided into two parts, an anterior cervical triangle and a posterior cervical triangle. We will be working mainly in the posterior cervical triangle in this dissection. In order for us to proceed, we first need to reflect the skin. And following the dissection guide instructions, uh, this should be done quickly. But be extremely careful because now we have worked in an area where the skin is the thinnest that we have yet seen. Going too deep, you will immediately involve one of the structures that we want to see in the neck area, and this is the platysma muscle. The Platysma muscle is actually a muscle uh, of facial expression. Although it, it is not in the facial region, it extends downward on both sides from the jawline above and extending down into the skin of the upper chest. However, in that we've dissected this upper chest region already, the muscle has been cut in our dissection. Notice this muscle is extremely thin. This and one of the muscles around the eye are probably the thinnest muscles of the body. Very diligently work along the free edge to reflect this muscle upward. It is a facial muscle, and therefore it is going to be innervated by one of the branches of the facial nerve. This branch, however, is seen only near the very upper portion of the mandible, coming into its underside in this location. This is the cervical branch of the facial nerve, which is the seventh cranial nerve. As you reflect this muscle, we will come on the sternocleidomastoid, again arising from sternum and clavicle below and passing upward behind the ear to the mastoid process. That now is one of the boundaries of the posterior cervical triangle along with the trapezius muscle and the clavicle below. And it's in this area that we will be studying uh, the material for this dissection. The branches of the cervical plexus come out into this area, and we will see the group of the cervical plexus nerves that are supplying basically the skin area. Winding around the back edge of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, running directly across it towards the midline, onto the undersurface of platysma, and then perforating platysma, this nerve supplies the skin of the anterior neck. Transverse cervical, because it has a transverse course across sternocleidomastoid. Another nerve that will be in the minimal amount of connective tissue between platysma and the sternocleidomastoid is a nerve that runs diagonally across sternocleidomastoid to get towards the lower jaw. This nerve will be passing to the skin of the lower earlobe and of the side of the jaw. This is the greater auricular nerve. 
And then another nerve passing upward towards the ear area follows the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid and continues up and then will supply the skin behind the ear as well as the scalp in that region. This is the lesser occipital nerve. So again in review, the transverse cervical nerve, the greater auricular nerve, and the lesser occipital nerve, all of the cervical plexus, whereas the nerve that innervates platysmal muscle is the cervical branch of the facial nerve. The skin that overlies this posterior cervical triangle, as well as extending downward to the clavicular region in the skin of the upper chest, that area is supplied by three nerves that come off of this cervical plexus, and these nerves are supraclavicular because they run over the clavicle. In that we've dissected the anterior upper chest region, these nerves then have been cut at their terminal branches, but we can demonstrate them here, passing out one towards the sternoclavicular joint skin, one towards the skin over the middle of the clavicle, and another one going out to the skin over the shoulder region. Supraclavicular nerves, the anterior, the middle, and laterally, the lateral or posterior. This dissection is fairly difficult because first of all, we have to reflect the platysma muscle very, very carefully so that you don't cut any of these nerves. And then the fascia that enwraps the sternoclinomastoid and trapezius muscle is extremely dense in this, the posterior cervical triangle. And so with great care, these nerves should be removed. Now underneath platysma muscle, that which we have cleaned off of now from the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius is a very thick wrapping of fascia. We have studied the fascia already on pectoralis major and on deltoid and on some of the back muscles such as latissimus dorsi and trapezius. But this fascia of the neck uh, is divided into several components and the one that we would be looking at now uh, surrounding sternocleidomastoid and trapezius is called the superficial layer of the investing fascia, of the deep cervical fascia. It is not subcutaneous connective tissue. It is deep cervical fascia, and it is the investing lamina or the superficial layer. You can use either term. High up in this region of the posterior cervical triangle, you will see a nerve that is exiting through sternocleidomastoid, whereas all of these other nerves of the cervical plexus that we've seen came from deep beneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This that comes through the sternocleidomastoid muscle is the accessory nerve. It is the motor supply to this, the trapezius muscle. It also is the supply to the sternocleidomastoid muscle when it is in this muscle. Accessory nerve tightly bound down by the investing cervical fascia. In addition to this area that we've been talking about in general, the posterior cervical triangle bounded by the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid, the anterior border of trapezius, and the clavicle below, this triangle now can be divided into two by a muscle that runs horizontally along almost the course of the clavicle. This is the omohyoid muscle. There are two bellies to the omohyoid muscle, and we are looking at its lower belly, the inferior belly, because its upper belly is found in the anterior cervical triangle, when, and when we get to that area, we will see it. Omohyoid muscle. That now is dividing our posterior cervical triangle into an upper larger triangle and a smaller triangular region here. The smaller triangular area bounded by clavicle, omohyoid, and this little section of the sternocleidomastoid muscle is called the clavicular triangle 
or omoclavicular. Whereas this larger triangle above that muscle now, posterior border of sternocleidomastoid, the trapezius muscle, and omohyoid below, this is the occipital triangle or occipital portion of the posterior cervical triangle. Classically, in this area, coming from just in front of the ear, we should see a large vein passing downward, diagonally across the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is the external jugular vein. It stands out well in the subcutaneous connective tissue when you see someone get mad, for example, you can see the vein of the neck, side of the neck standing out. That's the external jugular. That term tells us then that there is an internal jugular vein as well. But the problem is that along with this uh, venous system, most of the variations of the body that you will see will be in the venous system. And on this side of the cadaver, we do not have an external jugular vein. Because what has happened is that there's been a coalescing of the veins, and all of them have gone into the front area, the anterior cervical triangle. And here we have a very, very large vein, which instead of passing diagonally across the sternocleidomastoid muscle, is, as you see, running entirely along the front margin all the way down into the base of the neck. So we do not have an external jugular vein on this side, uh, and the internal jugular vein is deep beneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Usually this vein is much smaller that we see here, and it's located more towards the midline. This is the notch and protuberance of the thyroid cartilage, the Adam's apple area. So this lines you up with the midline. If we have some small veins running near the midline, vertically up and down the neck, they are called the anterior jugular vein. We talked already about the external jugular vein, and sometimes there will be a smallish vein running along the front border of sternocleidomastoid, which is called the communicating vein. And that is what we have here, a huge communicating vein that is replacing the external jugular and the anterior jugular vein. Continue then cleaning up this area, locating these structures on your specimen so that we then can move into the anterior cervical triangles uh, as we proceed into the next dissection. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.